years, it seems like. But the story of a doctor who was treating a little girl, a patient that was terribly sick. Uh, and the only hope for her was a transfusion. And uh, she had this rare disease, and she needed a transfusion. And the only hope for her was her five-year-old twin brother, because they're siblings, but also because he had had this disease already, and he had his antibodies in his blood. And so we can help her. So the doctor and the parents asked the little boy if he would be willing to give his blood for his sister, who was initially a little hesitant. The doctor told him that it was the only way to save his sister's life. So he then quickly said, yes, I'll do it. The boy's parents took him to the hospital where he was put on a gurney next to his sister, and they put the IVs in both of them, and his blood started transferring over to his sister. And the two lay there next to each other during the treatment. The doctor was relieved to kind of see some color return to the little girl's face. But he looked at the little boy, and his face was distraught. The doctor said, are you okay? And the boy said, when will I start to die? And that's when the doctor and the parents in the room were touched and moved by the immensity of this young boy who thought that he was literally giving his life to his sister. Touching story. It turns out I don't think it's true, but get you thinking. What would you be willing to die for? What would you be willing to lay down your life for? Your child? Your country. Your spouse? Your country. I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, your freedom? Your faith? How about a really big piece of chocolate cake with whipped cream and everything? I'd die for that. <laughs> yeah, because what you're willing to die for is a direct reflection of that which you value. What parent would not hesitate to die for their child? Right? And then think of all the brave men and women that laid down their life for the sake of freedom for our country. Or throughout the centuries, the martyrs that died for their faith. So what would you die for? It gets a reflection of what you value. Now, that might be a little bit heavy, a little bit grim, I mean, a little bit too extreme, so let's maybe back it up a little bit. What are you willing to sacrifice for? <laughs> Again, because that all, too, is a reflection of what you value. Um, clearly, during this past year in the pandemic, I value cooking or eating it. I'm getting back on my diet. But interesting, what are you willing to die for? And again, it's a reflection of what you value. So our text from the Gospel of John um, is part of this good shepherd narrative we kind of hit this time of the year every year. Uh, I think it's helpful maybe to understand this good shepherd story, this narrative, uh, to put it in context. So this is chapter 10 of John. So we kind of got to go back to chapter 9 because that comes before 10. Uh, in chapter 9, we get the story of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. And the man is then questioned by the Pharisees, the religious leaders, uh, about all of this. And long story shorter, the man was praising Jesus, was going to follow Jesus, so they kicked him out and chastised Jesus not only for healing, but he did it on the Sabbath. So now in chapter 10 here, in light of the failure and the spiritual blindness of these religious authorities who condemned the healing of a man born blind, uh, Jesus goes on to offer himself as a counterexample. And he picks up on this old theme that runs through the Old Testament of God's good shepherds. Uh, and he contra contrasts that with the leaders who shirk the responsibility and fail in caring for God's people. So Jesus sets up this contrast. We roll into chapter 10. Uh, and Jesus first contrasts the good, life-giving shepherd with the thief who only comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, he is the good shepherd, and he has come to give life and to give it abundantly. But not only that, he then starts in that he is a good shepherd, and he lays down his life for his sheep. You know, what would you die for? Because what you die for 
is a direct reflection of what you value. So in today's section, he now contrasts um, the good shepherd with the hired hand. Now, the hired hand isn't set out to destroy the sheep, but either are they committed enough uh, to take care of them, to lay down their lives for the sheep. They are pretenders. They're hired hands. They're there to do a job, and they're for the cash. So when the wolf comes, they don't care for the sheep because they don't own the sheep. And they're ready and willing to skedaddle and leave the sheep to deal with the wolves. So yeah, they're pretenders. They're hired hands. And hired hands have a uh, legitimate and important job to do. Um, but they do it for themselves with little regard for those who they're entrusted to, right? Somebody just do a job to get the money. <laughs> and you're not going to let it eat up your life. So thinking about this whole idea of the hired hand, you've got the good shepherd and the hired hand. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is just in it for themselves and the money, and they're not really having any ownership for the sheep. I got to thinking about the world we live in today. There's going to be a lot of hired hands. A lot of people that have really legitimate and important jobs, and institutions too, not just people. Um, they're important jobs to do, but they're really in it for themselves. When they can get out of it, and if it's going to threaten them, they'll just kind of move on. Uh, one of my former professors, uh, Pastor David Lose, identifies three areas that's really prominent in our society today. He says the first is a marketing saturated world intent on creating in us a sense of lack, a sense of scarcity, a sense of want that drives us to mindless consumption, mindless buying. So again, marketing has a really important role to play in, in our culture and society, but it's kind of moved away from just being about information to creating the sense of inadequacy, um, insecurity, uh, scarcity. You need this. If you want to prove yourself that you need this. And I read something really interesting uh, in line with this. When I grew up, how you grew up, we only got cartoons on Saturday morning. And it was probably for an hour to an hour and a half. There's a handful of cartoons. And there's only three channels back then, too. <gasps> but I read, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan became president, he wanted to deregulate a lot of industries, a lot of things. And what that led to was a lot of these toy companies started making cartoons to market to kids to sell their products. That's when we started getting cartoons like He-Man, G.I. Joe, and Thundercats, and Transformers. And then when I was in middle school, high school, that's when we had an explosion of cartoons, and kids became a marketing focus. Do they care about the kids? Or do they want to sell a product? That's kind of fascinating how it all kind of ties in. So this world of marketing, our higher hands, important role, but they're in it for the money. Second, he says, is the uh, recent rise and now omnipresent, if not dominant, uh, industry of social media. Right? Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. And it's legitimate and important. I mean, it's been very valuable over this past year for families to keep in touch with others while they're separated. And it's been important to us so I can record these things and get them out on the internet and on Facebook and YouTube and our website. So it has a very legitimate and important role to play. But at the end of the day, the dominant value of these social media companies like Facebook and YouTube is not our well-being. It's about money. Right? So these profits are tied directly to the time we spend on these sites. And it's all the personal data they can collect from us and they can <laughs> exploit and sell and take advantage of. And the longer they keep you onto their page or lead you into other pages and get advertisements, they make more money. One thing that drives me absolutely up the wall, I love cooking and I love to find new recipes. If you ever go and Google and look for a recipe, first you get this person's life story and there's advertisements all throughout it, pop-up things, and you go all the way down the page to finally, finally get the ingredients in the recipe. Why do they do that? The longer you stay on that page, the more money they get. It's not in it for you. <laughs> it's in it for the money. 
And even worse, they're so desperate to get traffic, uh, followers, likes, we now have this cult of the outrageous. We have people online doing more and more outrageous things to get our attention to come to their site. They're hired hands. They're not in it for you. They're in it for them. And third, he says, we live in a time of polarized and hyper-partisan politics of the division. And again, you can't emphasize this enough, but Democrat, Republican, um, our politics, our government, is a wonderful gift given to us by God. In fact, politics, or polis, in Greek means the people. And so it's one of God's ways of setting up an organization to care for one another. So again, it's an important and legitimate thing. We need that. But in recent years, the emphasis is increasingly on inviting us to define ourselves in terms of what or who we're against and what or who we are for. And that winds up leading to division and animosity and violence. Instead of defining us against who we are for, but who we are against. So what these three uh, higher hands have in common is an emphasis on a self, a higher hand. Uh, so they have all these false narratives of scarcity, insecurity, and fear that perpetuate all of this. So the message is consistent. You're not enough. You don't have enough. You need to justify yourself. You need to kind of prove yourself and your worth. Like I kind of talked about last week, this lie of uh, acquired significance. If you want to be significant, well, then do, you got to do something about it. You got to make yourself a value. So again, there's one single this is a message that like you got to justify yourself. So it seems like we live in this world of hired hands. A lot of people and institutions that are hungry to have sheep, to have followers, to have lights, but they will abandon you in a heartbeat when the wolf comes. That does come. In contrast, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I'm not a hired hand. I'm not in it for myself. I'm in it for my sheep whom I love. And I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes it from me. I lay it down because he loves you. If what you're willing to die for is a reflection of what you value. So we hear the story of Jesus the Good Shepherd laying down his life and picking it back up again for his sheep, which is you and me, and, and the world because there's other sheep they need to bring into the fold. We hear a new life-giving message that you truly are enough. You are enough. You have enough. In fact, you've got so much that we can share it with others. So in a world of hired hands that are out for themselves and will abandon you drop of a hat. As followers of Jesus, we are given this promise of his presence, the promise of his protection, and the promise that we're empowered to go out and share this life-giving message, showing what we do truly value. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep is a reflection of what he values. And that's you. Amen.